My best friend in grade school was a kid named Riley. Here's a picture of Riley and me standing in the field behind our house. I'm on the left, he's on the right. It was the day after Christmas, 1962. We were both nine years old and sporting new BB guns that our fathers gave us the day before on Christmas morning. For six years, all through grade school, Riley and I were like-minded best friends. In fact, in those days, we were like one soul in two different bodies. That's how close we were. We thought alike, we dressed alike, we loved the same candy bars, big hunks, black cows, and three musketeers. We slept over at one another's homes most weekends, watched the same TV shows, and we both loved the game Sorry. We'd stay up all nights playing Sorry, or until our parents had enough and made us turn out the lights. Each year, as Christmas approached, Riley and I would put our heads together and conspire concerning what we wanted for Christmas. One year it was BB gun air rifles. Another year it was gas-powered airplanes, the kind that went round and round, tethered to strings controlled by hand. One Christmas it was Lionel trains, the next it was new Schwinn bikes. Each year, something different. Christmas Day, we'd call each other up and ask, Did you get it? Yes, we'd answer. Here's the deal. Although we weren't fraternal brothers, in many ways, Riley and I were spiritual ones. We were truly like-minded, twin souls. I suppose that's the key to all good friendships. I suspect you've had a friend or two like that over the course of your lifetime. One thing Riley and his best friend Little Richie could count on was this. Come Christmas morning, we could count on our fathers. We knew that we would find our heart's desire under the Christmas tree. Hello, I'm Rich Musler, Bible teacher and pastor of a very small church in Louisville, Texas. Thank you for studying the scriptures with me today. The Apostle Paul had a friend like my friend Riley, a twin soul. He speaks of him in his letter to the Philippians. Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I also may be encouraged when I hear news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character, because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Although Timothy was young enough to be Paul's son, the apostle notes that they were kindred spirits. Like-minded, he says. That word in the original Greek is actually equal souls. Paul and Timothy were two equal souls knit together by the work they did. They were kindred spirits in their love of Jesus Christ. Paul said in verse 21 that most folks seek their own personal interests at the expense of others, but that Timothy wasn't one of them. The apostle characterized his protege as a young man with proven character. Literally, the Greek word means tested, as in tested by fire. Timothy had been with Paul when they planted the church in Philippi. He was with him at Ephesus, and he was staying with Paul in Rome at the time he wrote this letter. Of all the people we read about in the New Testament who were not original disciples of Christ Jesus, we know the most about Timothy. Thanks in part to the letters written by Paul and also to the history provided by the physician Luke, who wrote about Timothy and others in the book, the New Testament book that we call Acts. Now, for any of you who may question what you see in the younger generation or doubt the value of your demonstrating your faith to them, Timothy is proof positive that it is worth the effort. He is the first, second-generation Christian in the Bible. Though your children or your grandchildren or nieces and nephews may not appear to be listening or even to take notice when you show and tell them about Jesus and what it means to be a Christian, it's definitely worth your effort to do so. Timothy was a member of the younger generation who was influenced by godly relatives. His mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois were believers. Here is a depiction of young Timothy and his grandmother Lois, done in 1648 by Rembrandt. You can almost sense the influence she had on her grandson. Paul said this about them, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, Timothy, 
which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. Timothy is said to have been acquainted with the scriptures since childhood. It's my guess that his mother and grandmother read them to him at bedtime. So don't give up on the young people in your life. Good heavens, we were all young once. Thank goodness the older generation of our day didn't give up on us. Because of older believers, Timothy came to know the Lord. He was born again. Who's the Timothy in your world? Are you reading the scriptures to him or her? Are you open and honest about your faith? Do you demonstrate to the younger generation by your loving attitude and caring actions what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Timothy's father was a Greek Gentile, and we don't know if he was a believer. We won't know until we get to heaven, but there is no evidence given in the Bible that he was a Christian. Timothy had grown up with a Christian mother and a grandmother, blessed in a loving atmosphere from his youth. And from a child, he had known the Holy Scriptures, the Bible tells us. Still, as a young man, he often had infirmity and tears. He needed to be challenged to stir up the gift that was within him, to not be ashamed of the gospel, but to fight against uh, the disabling spirit of fear, and to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy needed to mature spiritually. Since his biological father was not a strong Christian influence, Paul took him under his wing and mentored him. We can learn a lot by studying the relationship between Paul and Timothy. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, he addresses him as my true son in the faith. We first meet Timothy in Acts 16 when Paul is heading out on his second missionary journey. He stops in at Lystra to pick up the young disciple. Timothy accompanies him, assists him, and serves as a sort of apprentice under him. Therefore, Paul's initial relationship with Timothy was a Christian role model, a spiritual father. It breaks my heart to see young children growing up in homes without fathers taking a role in their spiritual upbringing. I think there is a whole generation of parents today not attending church because their fathers did not take them. And if that trend goes uncorrected, it's a death spiral for the church. Year after year, church attendance has dropped off more and more. I'm convinced that started with men who decided they just don't need to go to church. Take the kids if you want, they tell their wives. I'm just not interested. So they stay home, they watch sports or go fishing or hunting. Many mothers do their best to bring their children to church, but without a strong believing Christian father leading the way, the children eventually lose interest and stop attending. You men who are mature Christian believers, you must be willing to step in as Paul did. Serve as a spiritual father to someone, a role model. To whom, you ask? Well, look around. God will show you to whom. Be it your grandchildren or nieces or nephews or the kids next door, find a way to mentor the younger generation. And ladies, for many of you, this is instinctive behavior, but it isn't enough to mentor girls and teach them how to be a woman. You must teach them how to be a Christian woman. So many kids today need a spiritual foster parent or a grandparent that will take them to church so that they may be grounded in the faith. God has a plan for their lives too, you know. Who will tell them that if you don't? Who will teach them that God loves them if their biological parents don't understand that simple truth themselves, you must be willing to step up and model what it means to be a Christian man or a Christian woman and go beyond even that. Mentor and counsel and coach some young person just as Paul did Timothy. That's really the second phase of demonstrating your faith to young people. First, take them to church. Then mentor them after they become believers. Become the model of what a mature Christian acts like and talks like and walks like. Let them see in you Christ-like behavior. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, he points out that you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, 
What persecutions I endured! What young believer observes your patience, love, and endurance as you face the challenges and the sufferings that you endure? Is anyone following your teaching, your conduct, and your purpose and faith? Who is watching you? I'm convinced that one reason God allows you to experience tragedy and suffering is so that others may observe in you how a Christian handles such things. They will be drawn to Christ Jesus because of what they see in you. Paul demonstrated to Timothy with his life. Then he challenged Timothy to learn by his example. He wanted that younger man to emulate his trust in the Lord. My friends, do the same with the young men and women you know. Demonstrate with your life how a Christian handles tough times and illness and even a broken heart. Let them emulate you. Prepare them spiritually for the challenges they will face themselves. Prepare them by exemplifying what it means to be a faithful believer who trusts the Lord in every circumstance, good times and bad, plenty and lack, pleasure and pain. That's your job. You've probably heard people say that Christianity is always one generation from extinction. That may be overstating it, I don't know. But fact is, to learn what it means to be a Christian, the next generation of believers is entirely dependent upon the older generation that's gone before them. And guess what? That's us. Jesus directed us to share the good news with all the world, but it begins at home. Don't be proud of the money you give to missions if you are unwilling to be a missionary to your own grandkids. Your mission field are the children and grandchildren and the nieces and the nephews and the kids next door who lack strong spiritual Christian examples. If their parents won't take them to church, bring them yourself. You must step up and teach them not just the good news, but how to live the good news. And here's the deal. If you don't do it, who will? The next generation is watching the older generation. If we fail to teach them God's way, there are plenty out there who are more than willing to teach them another way, a way that seems perfectly sensible and even right. But the Bible tells us this, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Are you mentoring a young believer? My guess is that there's a young person in your world who could use some help developing his or her faith, some guidance in spiritual growth, someone who needs to be challenged to stir up the gift that is in him or her. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a silver platter. So speak a word at the appropriate moment. That's what Paul did for Timothy. It was in the year AD 64 that Paul left Timothy at Ephesus. Ephesus, an ancient Greek city on the coast of Ionia, lies exactly opposite across the Aegean Sea from Athens. These photos show the excavation of the city at Ephesus that existed in Paul's day. Timothy faced many challenges in Ephesus. He was dealing with some bullheaded church members. There was much untruth and false doctrine being taught by these older men. Paul told him to stay there and command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths. Paul also told him, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. In my early 20s, I was asked to teach a class of adults who were twice my age. They were all in their 40s and 50s. I thought they were ancient. I was nervous about it, but accepted the challenge. But after teaching a few classes, I had second thoughts. I doubted my ability to teach these older believers anything from the Bible that they didn't already know. I met with my pastor, a very wise man named Bernie Fritzke, and told him of my concern. He opened his Bible and shared a verse with me. Guess which one it was? Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He told me that the secret to teaching the Bible is to come prepared. In fact, he told me, always be over-prepared. I've never forgotten that advice and have let Pastor Fritzke's wisdom guide me ever since. Pastor Bernie Fritzke mentored me. 
He was always ready to answer my questions and always offered an encouraging word. He took me under his wing. I'm forever grateful. Timothy's equal soul relationship with Paul was such that Paul soon felt he could trust that younger man with any assignment, however challenging it may be. And Timothy so admired Paul that he never let him down. Paul once said this about Timothy, I have no one like him. So when Paul was in a Roman prison awaiting his trial and eventual execution, he summoned his faithful younger friend. Timothy dropped everything and came as soon as he could. It was there in Rome that Paul wrote many of his epistles. Timothy's name appears as co-author on several of them, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. Timothy was acquainted with the scriptures since childhood. His mother and grandmother made certain of that. Please do the same for some young person in your life. You just have no idea who you may be mentoring. Perhaps it's the next Timothy or Billy Graham or Joyce Meyer. You just don't know. There was another man with them in Rome, Epaphroditus. The people in Philippi had sent Epaphroditus to help minister to Paul. And now Paul wrote this to them. I consider it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Epaphroditus was a layman, a man with no formal training who stepped up to do whatever was asked of him. Paul refers to him as a fellow soldier. You can see the humility in Paul. This great man who wrote much of the New Testament never thought of himself as the man in charge or the boss of all. He never demanded the best and always paid his own way. And to Paul, his co-workers were all brothers in Christ, fellow foot soldiers serving the king of kings at his side. Just listen to how Paul praises Epaphroditus. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Twice this man Epaphroditus risked his life to work with Paul. Paul wrote that he came close to death, not regarding his life. That phrase, not regarding his life, in the original Greek means that he gambled with or he bet his life in order to work with Paul. Just as a soldier risks his life every time he enters the field of battle, so must we who serve in the Lord's army be willing to risk everything to advance the kingdom of heaven. It is worthy to note that Paul demonstrated great sensitivity with regard to sin. Paul's humility was genuine. He recognized his own weakness. He once wrote, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. The sin which he had himself committed against the Lord Jesus, the persecution of believers and overseeing their arrest and imprisonment, when looked at from one point of view, might be explainable on account of the honest, although mistaken, motive which lay at the bottom of it. The man then known as Saul believed Christians were preaching heresy. He wanted to put an end of what he believed was false teaching. But Paul, even after allowing for his ignorance, declares that of sinners, he was the chief, the worst of all. His point is this, if he obtained mercy in light of the horrific sins he had committed, then mercy is available to all. He describes himself as having been a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious to those who were innocent. Paul seems astonished that he should have been saved. Have you ever asked yourself, why would God save such a one as Saul? <laughs> I doubt it, because living on this side of the first century, it's obvious to us Christians that God used Paul to take the gospel to the Gentiles. 
He used Paul's intelligence to write two-thirds of the New Testament. It is easy for us to see that God clearly had a plan for the life of the Apostle Paul. Paul was just the man God needed to accomplish his will in that place at that moment in time. I'm always reminding people of this. God has a plan for your life. You've heard me say that so often, it probably sounds trite. But think of it this way. You fit into the kingdom of God like a finely cut puzzle piece. No other puzzle piece quite fits precisely where you fit. In time and space, in the year 2020, where you find yourself situated today, you are placed there by the hand of God for a purpose. There's something that he wants you to accomplish. There's someone whose life he wants you to impact by sharing your faith and words of encouragement that exemplify the love of Christ. You're no different than Paul. God had a plan for his life. He has a plan for your life too. And frankly, as long as you have breath in your lungs, God isn't finished with you yet. He's got more for you to do. The only question is, will you do it? Paul could have said no. So can you. The Apostle Paul described himself as the worst among sinners. He confessed that he'd been a blasphemer and a persecutor. But, he said, I obtained mercy. And so he said yes to God. Why of all people did God choose the wicked man that Paul once was to demonstrate mercy? Why was such an evil man saved? Well, here's why. It's obvious. Paul had unique skills and abilities that God needed. Paul fit like a finely cut puzzle piece into God's plan for building his kingdom. And the same holds for you. You were hand-selected. God chose you. Thank God you said yes when he called. You obtained mercy. And now there's a job God wants done that precisely fits your unique skills and abilities. Paul is an example of a sinner who once saved, rolled up his sleeves, and went to work. Some say to me, well, I have regrets. I missed my opportunities to serve the Lord. I got divorced. I turned to drink. I failed my family and friends. I'm saved by grace, but God has no use for a blackened soul like mine. My friend, were that true, you wouldn't be alive today. If God had no use for you here on earth, you'd be at his side in heaven. The only way to muster out of the Lord's army is to take a final breath. Until then, he has an active duty assignment with your name on it. It's time to soldier up. There's much work to be done. There is a whole new generation of young believers who need to be encouraged and mentored. Paul is no longer on this earth. He's finished his job, but you are. If God could use a man like Paul to accomplish so much, then surely he could use you too. Paul's protege, Timothy, was imprisoned at least once for his faith, though we have no details of why or where or when or even for how long because his imprisonment is not recorded in the Bible. We know that he was in custody only because the writer of Hebrews wrote this. Be aware that our brother Timothy has been released. If he comes soon enough, he will be with me when I see you. You also won't read in the Bible how Timothy died, but ancient historians recorded the event. In the year AD 97, the then 80 plus year old Timothy tried to halt a procession honoring the goddess Diana. Diana was the Roman goddess of the hunt. She was worshipped to assure that food got put on the table. Timothy stood before the parade, stopped it, and preached the gospel. Jesus saves! The angry pagans had enough of Christians preaching about the one true God. The metal workers, those who made and sold idols, had seen their revenue drop as the number of Christians increased. Infuriated, they grabbed Timothy, beat him, dragged the old man through the streets, and then stoned him to death. Paul made a distinction between Christians. He put them into two buckets. The difference in these buckets is startling. You find the comparison in Philippians 1.21 and 2.21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. 
Remember, these were Christians Paul was talking about. Every Christian lives either in bucket number one or bucket number two. You get to choose. Paul lived in the first bucket. He was himself a Philippians 121 sort of guy. He said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. How about you? There is really no middle ground here. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where are you storing your treasure? Whose interests are you seeking? Which bucket are you in? When you actively serve the Lord, you soon discover that you have like-minded friends serving God beside you. They are your equal souls, as Paul called them. They serve with you in a variety of different capacities. That's certainly true in my life. My co-workers in Christ are truly soulmates when it comes to serving the Lord. Each and every one of us share the same desire. We just want to get before the parade, stop it, and preach the gospel. Jesus saves. In a way, those Christian brothers and sisters of mine share a bond with me that is just as deep and as strong as the bond I first experienced with my childhood chum, Riley. When it comes to serving God, we think alike, we talk alike, we share the same heart's desire, and best of all, for us, every day is Christmas. Riley and I knew we could count on our fathers to give us the desires of our hearts. For those kindred spirits of mine and me, in a very real sense, every day is Christmas. Our Father in heaven never lets us down. He grants us the desires of our hearts. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your hearts. Christians are not meant to be lone wolves. We need each other. That's why we congregate in churches. Generally speaking, we can accomplish so much more when we link up with those who are like-minded. So here's my question for you. Who are your equal souls when it comes to serving the Lord? With whom are you like-minded? If you can't think of anybody, could it be because you aren't actively serving the Lord? Or are you trying to be a lone wolf? It's an honor to serve God with like-minded equal souls. We all just want to get in front of that parade and stop it and preach the good news. I'm Rich Musler. May God bless and keep you until we meet again.